Hello viewers and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy. In this video I'll be tackling one of my bigger projects where I try to convert a Mark 15 Seafire using the Airfix Mark 17 Seafire and a Tamiya Mark 5 kit. After watching Paul Budzik convert a few Spitfires on his channel, I decided to take a step from scratch building to doing something a bit bigger. Initially I thought this was going to be a very easy conversion to do because Airfix does a Mark 15 Griffin engine to Spitfire and then they do a Mark 17 Seafire and there's been a previous build where someone just simply swapped the wings from the kits. However, after a lot of research online, the hobby shops and some online vendors, I was not able to find a Mark 15 Airfix kit for a Spitfire, so I had to do something else. I did, however, have a Tamiya Mark 5 Spitfire in the kit and that would have to make do. One of the biggest challenges before I even got out of the gates with this build is the fact that Airfix's plastic is so much thicker than Tamiya's that there'd have to be a lot more bodywork than I anticipated. Ideally, I wanted to make all of my cuts and sections along panel lines, that way I could rescribe them, but that proved to be a little difficult as well, because Tamiya's panel lines are a lot thinner than Airfix's. One thing I continue to not understand is why Airfix's kits released in the last two years still have these thicker panel lines where Tamiya was already on point in 1994 with panel lines on aircraft. Now that I've initially cut the sections I want from each kit, I start placing them together using the left side of the Mark 17 Seafire as a guide to make sure everything still lines up to the original lines of the aircraft. You can see that there's some gaps here as Airfix and Tamiya have a different approach to that uh, section on the wing, so we're going to have to fill that in with some glue and come back and rescribe that afterwards to fix it up. I wanted to use the Airfix's Mark 17 tail for this build, however it's too thick with the Tamiya fuselage and I couldn't get it to set properly. So you'll notice here in a few minutes that it changes from the Airfix grey to the Tamiya brown plastic. Now that I'm happy with how the right side of the aircraft is going together, I start on the left side and basically repeat the procedure. While I'm cutting and gluing here, let's talk about Canadian naval aviation history. Unfortunately, fixed wing aviation only lasted 25 years in the Canadian Navy, but it did have a promising start. Canadian naval aviation didn't begin until 1945. During World War II, Canada lacked its own fleet air arm, and the two carriers under Canadian command, HMS Nabob and HMS Puncher, were recruited by both Royal Navy and Royal Canadian Navy personnel. Brits and Canadians worked the ship while only the Brits did the flying. This continued until the end of the war while the RCN used this opportunity to build knowledge for future training. HMS Nabob, the Puncher sister ship, operated under the same binational conditions and participated in an attack against the Tirpitz. During that attack, the Nabob was torpedoed by a German U-boat and was too damaged to repair sitting out the rest of the war. As the focus of future operations at sea during the Second World War shifted to the Pacific Theater, planning began in May 1944 that the Royal Canadian Navy would require a larger fleet, both in numbers and in size of ships. In the effort, the RCN returned the American escort carriers Puncher and Nabob in exchange for the loan of two light fleet carriers. Reduction in service size, though, meant that Canada could only crew one carrier and that the HMCS Warrior would become the first Royal Canadian Navy carrier crewed completely by Canadian ranks. The Seafire has an interesting history with the fleet air arm of the Royal Navy because it was never developed for shipborne use. The Seafire was simply a Spitfire fitted with a tail hook, and because of its weak landing gear, it suffered a lot of training and landing accidents on board ship. Over the next several years, Supermarine and Westland would try to develop the Seafire more to be tamed on board ship. In the spring of 1945, two Royal Navy Seafire Squadrons, numbers 803 and 883, were formed at Royal Naval Air Station Arbroath, Scotland, by transferring ex-Royal Canadian Air Force pilots to the British Fleet Air Arm. On the 14th of March, 1946, the same date that HMCS Warrior, the first Royal Canadian Navy carrier, was commissioned, both 803 and 883 squadrons were transferred to Royal Canadian Navy. A total of 35 Seafires served with the Royal Canadian Navy, and these aircraft became Canadian property on June 1, 1946, as part of the war claim settlement between Canada and Britain. The Mark 15 Seafire was still prone to accidents on board ship, and it wasn't tamed until the release of the Mark 17 Seafire. Featuring revised landing gear shocks, it was able to give naval aviators a larger margin of error when landing while cutting power over the deck. The Royal Navy continued with the Mark 17 Seafire in service, however the Royal Canadian Navy was already looking to replace their Mark 15s. Their experience with the Mark 15 Seafire had already put a cloud over the next Seafire contender. With the amount of surplus aircraft in storage, the US Navy offered up 50 Hellcats to the Canadian Navy with spares, parts, and training at a significantly reduced price. 
It should also be mentioned at this point that the Royal Navy, to meet Lend-Lease agreements with the Americans, were pushing crated Corsair aircraft off their decks to avoid having to pay to return the Corsairs to the United States. Why these surplus aircraft were never purchased from the British by the Royal Canadian Navy is a mystery, but it did make for interesting times. In 1947, the Seafires were replaced on board ship by Hawker Sea Fury aircraft, and the HMCS Warrior was traded in for the HMCS Magnificent in 1948 due to it being unfit for cold weather service, and the Seafires were moved ashore to HMCS Shearwater for training and retired from Royal Canadian Navy service in 1954. With the fuselage parts now grafted together, it's now time to start filling some gaps. And to do this, I'm using slices of styrene sheeting and super glue from the inside of the aircraft. Once this is all dried and hardened up, I'll come in with some 600 and then 3000 grit sanding sponge to start cleaning up the aircraft. There's two things I'm not really a fan of when building models, and they're both sanding and rescribing lines, and this project's going to include a lot of it. The last kit I built with this much sanding and modification was when I built my filletless Mustang by Tamiya. And a few weeks after finishing that, Edward announced that they were going to build a filletless Mustang, and so did Airfix. While building this kit, I was expecting somebody to drop a proper Mark 15 Seafire. And now that Tamiya has released their P38 Lightning, I'm not sure if I want to continue with my Academy build, which features a lot of resin. But that's a different topic for a different video. After a lot of research and a lot of scrounging online, there's only really a 148 scale Seafire that's available on the market, and that's been built by Rubble. And having been burned by them twice in the past with kits, I didn't want to chance it. And that kit doesn't involve folding wings, which makes the whole thing irrelevant, which is what I wanted to do in the first place. My plan here is to have this side by side with the Sea Fury I'm going to build as well with folded wings and having them look like they're sitting in a museum together. While we're sitting here watching me sand for days on end, why don't you take a moment and write in the comments section what's your biggest modeling project you've ever done. For me, this is my journey onto building up to bigger projects. By doing all this cutting and sanding and rescribing, it's given me a lot of experience to go onto my next models down the road, which actually consider a lot of resin. One of them being the Tamiya Corsair with a full Ares resin pack. And if you know anything about Ares resin kits, you have to know how to cut and sand to use them. With sectioning the aircraft models as I did, I was able to save most of the Tamiya kit to be used for the interior. With this Seafire having folded wings, I didn't want to get too crazy on detail in the cockpit, as most of it's going to be blocked anyways. But by just drilling out these holes, you add a little bit more interest for the viewers. If you have any experience with these PCB drill bits, you know that those things like to snap and come flying off at you, so be very careful when using them. Here I'm just stretching a cotton bud and going to use some copper wire to add some more piping to the oxygen cylinders behind the pilot seat. And as you can tell, this can take some time trying to get some copper wire through that cotton bud. And as always, if you're a fan of this video or any of the other videos on this channel, definitely click the like button and subscribe for more updates when videos are dropping. If you're not a fan of the video and you're disliking it, please take a moment to let me know why in the comment section. And with that piping now on the tanks, it's now time to continue on with the cockpit. As you can tell, the bottom of the cockpit there is a little bit of a mess with the seam and all the super glue. And like I said before, you're not going to see much of this cockpit, so I'm just going to come in later with some black paint and cover that up and try to hide it in the shadows. The only way you could probably fix that would be to shave all that detail down completely and add in some resin parts. But because this kit was a learning experience, I didn't want to put too much money into it in case it went pear-shaped and I was out 30 to 40 bucks. It seems lately that resin costs twice as much as the actual model kit itself. I picked up both of these kits from PM Hobbycraft from their consignment section at a steal for $20 each. One thing I'm bad for when purchasing model kits or looking at the stash is having those ideas build onto other ideas and my wife will usually laugh at me because I'll see a model kit and it'll immediately bring up another aircraft of mine that I know I'd want to do. Example of that is you can't talk about Canadian fixed wing naval history without talking about the Banshee and the Tracker as well. Hang on! It's not the projects that annoy me, it's when he says, this is my last kit I'm getting for a while, and then a week later he finds another kit marked down. I laugh because he's a liar, a liar that finds good deals. Well, there you have it from the horse's mouth and the in-house expert here on being cheap, because don't you know that's how Scott's invented copper wire? It was two of them fighting over a penny. Ugh. 
I'm just adding some details here to the cockpit and scratching up the seat to make it look like it's a well-worn aircraft because these aircraft were secondhand to Canada. A notable sea fire that's actually on display is at the Museum of the Regiments in Calgary, Alberta. This aircraft used to be the gate guardian at HMCS Tecumseh, but it's now on display in the naval exhibit of the museum. Displayed alongside the Sea Fire are its follow-ups, the Sea Fury and the McDonnell Douglas Banshee. 17 years of Royal Canadian Navy fighters side by side. Although the Royal Canadian Navy didn't have its own aviation branch during World War II, Canada did have pilots go to fly with the British Fleet Air Arm during the conflict. One of those pilots who joined the British Fleet Air Arm was Lieutenant Hampton Gray, who flew the Corsairs late in the war. Gray took part in one of the attacks on the Tirpitz, and although the attack itself was not successful, he did engage three destroyers at the time, and was mentioned in dispatches. A year later, the British Fleet Air Arm was participating in the invasion in Okinawa and attacking Japanese targets around the area of Tokyo. Gray was mentioned in dispatches again, and awarded with the Distinguished Service Cross after his unit attacked several merchant ships, sank a destroyer, and also attacked a Japanese airfield. On August 9th, with the war's end only days away, Gray was leading another section of Corsairs to attack five ships in a Japanese harbor. His aircraft was hit and set aflame, and even on fire, he still pressed home his attack on a Japanese destroyer and hit it with a bomb. The ship later sank from the damage, but Gray's aircraft was downed and his body never recovered. For his gallantry this day, Hampton Gray was awarded the Victoria Cross, one of only two awarded to the fleet air arm during World War II. A memorial for Hampton Gray was erected at Onagawa Bay in 1989, where at the same area where his aircraft was suspected to have crashed, and this is the only memorial dedicated to a foreign soldier on Japanese soil. Now that the two halves of the sea fire are together, it's going to be time for a lot more sanding to clean up all those joints and glue marks where everything has had to be filled in. If you're doing this type of kit bash, I can let you know right now that there is so much filling and sanding involved, you have to prepare yourself for a lot of work. I didn't expect it to be this much with the modifications I was doing, and there were several points where the kit went back up on the shelf because I didn't know if I wanted to continue it or not. What helped me get back to this build, though, was during the time it was sitting on the shelf, I was also working on the Hobby Boss Wildcat, and having seen that start to come together while the Sea Fire was looking at me, I finally found the motivation to get it back on the bench afterwards and finally complete it. By the time this was in primer and ready for paint, I'm pretty sure I'd put close to two weeks into it just rescribing and sanding all those seams just to have it properly ready, in my opinion, because when you put primer on, every little imperfection starts to show, and it felt like I was constantly going back to fix a seam line here or add in another panel line where there was supposed to be one. Just to give you an idea of the amount of work that had to go into all of that, I'll, I've decided to leave in a few minutes of footage just to show all the sanding and scribing that was taking place. And this should give you an idea of the amount of work involved. So whilst we're sitting here watching me sand plastic with paper and not try to set it on fire, let's play a little Canadian trivia game. Question 1. Which of the following did the Royal Canadian Navy pioneer? Is it A. Refueling vessels while flying operations were underway? B. Operating helicopters as a plane guard to replace the plane guard destroyer? Or C. Transporting cars on deck back to North America belonging to the ship's company? And the correct answer for that one is going to be B, operating helicopters as a plane guard to replace the plane guard destroyer. And it should also be noted that the Canadian Navy pioneered operating helicopters off of destroyers and fi frigates as part of an anti-submarine warfare tactic. It also should be noted that C may also be true. I can't confirm it or not. However, not only did the ship's company of the HMCS Bonaventure try to bring cars back to Canada after the ship was commissioned, there was also two seamen who tried to bring a horse back on board as well. That was considered crossing the line, though, and the officers ordered the horse off the ship. And later on, it was noted that there's horse manure that was starting to turn up in the officer's mess. But the Bonaventure will have to wait for another video as we're talking about the sea fire on board Canadian ships. Since there's still standing taking place on the video, let's also talk about another person who got me interested in history, and that was my grandfather, who also served in the Royal Navy as a boy seaman before transferring to the Canadian Navy in the 50s. He served on board the Bonaventure, but just to give you an idea of the teamwork and the comradeship that's built on board a ship, my grandfather told me a story of how he was coming back from Egypt and he had all these scratches on his face, but he wouldn't tell his wife where he got them. Even after his funeral, I asked some of his shipmates, where did the scratches come from? And I was told what happens in the Navy stays in the Navy, although part of me suspects it probably had something to do with prostitutes. 
Now that all the sanding's been completed and everything's looking flush, it's time to hit this with some Mr. Surfacer to try to see if there's any last things that are going to stick out. And just to try to tie everything together a bit more between the two models, I decided to run some rivets on this aircraft. If you would like a more in-depth tutorial on how to run rivets, I do have a video here on my channel that's about eight minutes long that will show you how to do that from scratch and explain the whole process of even getting the blueprints to run the rivets as well. Another quick fun story about Papa Model Guy that I can't help but tell right now talking about the Canadian Navy is he was actually shipped back from Boston one night because he was all hammered up with his shipmates and decided to jump into a pool that was empty and broke his legs. But the best part of that story is he couldn't swim to begin with. Now, if you're looking to run panel lines and repair them on your aircraft, one of the tricks that I've learned from watching YouTube and experimenting is to lay 3M tape in two layers and cut it, and that'll give you a flexible ruler that you can run your scribe across to make nice light passes to get those panel lines set, and then come in afterwards with a razor saw and trace it if you want a little bit more uh, defined line. You'll notice here too that because I'm using that tape as a guide, and it's flexible, I can wrap it all the way around the fuselage and continue that line and not lose anything over the contours. The cowling snaps presented another challenge because I needed to find some type of tool that I could use to create that circular imprint with a snap in the middle, and the closest I could come was using a hypodermic needle that I heated up a little bit, and I got those from the drugstore for free after explaining to the pharmacist that I was not using them for heroin. And here come the rivets. As I've said once before in my videos, and probably a couple times now, is riveting is the number one thing I find that really can bring a model to life if it's done right with the proper references. And the Rosie the Riveter tool that I bought is the second favorite purchase after my airbrush. To get into the really tight areas that I can't hit with the Rosie the Riveter tool, I'll use a compass from a math set to get into the corners, such as on the wing route. With rivets on the aircraft finally sanded and the aircraft in primer, it finally satisfied me to the point where it looked like it was one complete aircraft and not two kits that had been put together. With the rivets on and the aircraft back in primer, it was time to spray some black and see if there was any imperfections that were still showing. And with none being visible, it was time to start using the splatter template to weather up this aircraft. With the marbling in place, it was time to lay down some thin layers of color I know you've seen this before in uh, two other videos with the Wildcat and Spitfire, but a few people requested a little more depth on the painting, so I figured I would extend this a little bit just so you can see those colors slowly build up over time. I generally don't put clear coats on my paints before decals. I find that's usually an unnecessary step, but where this is my first time using funk decals, I decided to put the clear coat on just in case I had to remove the decals or make adjustments and try to protect that paint a little bit. But in this case, it turns out to be something I didn't need because the decals went on great. They were nice and thin, very minimal carrier film. And with a little bit of micro saw and micro set, they fell right into the panel lines and rivets with zero issues. I'll definitely be getting those again. And these decals you're seeing here, they're not actually custom decals for this Sea Fire. They're actually decals that I've pulled off the Funk Decals set for the Canadian Sea Fury. So you can count on seeing that build down the road, but I used the earlier markings on the Sea Fire just so I could have two different variants of paint on the shelf. Now that all the decals are on, I'm going to seal those in with two coats of clear and then sand those down with a sanding sponge, 3000 grit, just to take that little bit of film off and have a nice clean look on the aircraft so that they're almost painted on. This is one of these processes that doesn't seem like it's a big deal to skip it or not, but generally when you start to weather the aircraft, you'll notice that you'll have little steps where the decals are sitting because they're not flat with the clear coat or paint around them. So this may seem like an unnecessary step, and some people may not want to do it, but in my opinion, it's something that will make your decals and painting and marking on the aircraft look that much better. Now it's time to work on the exhaust pipes from the Griffin engine. These are the stock pipes out of the airfix kit and all I'm doing here is just scraping down that seam line and what I'll end up doing is drilling these out and hollowing them a little, just to try to make them a little more interesting and get away from that stagnant solid plastic look. 
don't be afraid to try this stuff because these are one of these things that you can practice on any discarded plastic. Just try punching your hole in the middle for a center punch. Come in and drill it and try widening it out and see how far you can go. Uh, at this point, I'm starting to get very thin on some of these pipes, and I don't think I'd push this much further without risk of damaging them. Here's a challenge I'm still trying to overcome, and that's trying to find a correct exhaust painting sequence to make them look good. I don't want to have them just look fully rusty because aircraft exhaust doesn't really rust. So what I'm trying to do is just come up with like a steelish color, put a little bit of rust pigment and a little bit of black pigment on there just to make them look used but not super rusted out. I decided to do the arresting hook down on this aircraft just to add a little more interest in it. And one of the challenges is when the tail hook is down on the Seafire Mark 15, it actually is the stinger style, so it hangs down further than the tail wheel. So you'll see the fix for that here in a few minutes. Here for the watch, I'm just putting down the thin burnt umber oil paint with a little bit of enamel thinner. It was a hard choice to make because while the aircraft was just sitting in the gloss, it looked awesome and it looked like a museum quality piece, which is where this is going to end up is in a small diorama with the Sea Fury. But at the same time, I decided it was too clean and it was time to just dirty it up a little bit just to make it a little more interesting. Just a little splattering of burnt umber paint here just to add some wear and tear to where the aircraft handlers would be moving this around by hand on the deck. And just thinning that back out with a sponge with some enamel thinner on it. I usually get these sponges out of the Edward Photo Etch kits, and they're pretty easy to find in electronics as well. The last step is to put the folded wings on here, and to make this easier, I glued the posts in place first to give myself a little bit of a locating tab and to hold the wing in place while it's drying. Unfortunately, there's no positive locks or anything to really set that wing in place, so you end up counting a lot on that bar just to hold the wing in the proper position while it dries. And you can see that here while I'm trying to get it in place as it's not solidly sitting in a single spot. And with that wing now in place, that brings this build to a conclusion. So if you liked the video, make sure you hit like and subscribe. And if you didn't like it, leave a comment in the comment section and let me know why. This is the Model Guy, and I'll see you next time.